Hello! Today on How Things Work, we're going to talk about sound. What makes sound? It's actually pretty simple. When my vocal cords vibrate, they move the air. And those air waves are at a certain frequency. They're actually technically compression waves. The density of the air is a little stronger, and then a little weaker, a little higher density, a little lower density, and that waves of air comes, and when it hits your ear, you have an eardrum, and it's a very sensitive membrane. So the higher density air, and then lower density, and higher density, actually makes your eardrum vibrate. That's picked up through your ear, in nerves, which then tell your brain, hey, that's a sound. So sounds can be very different. Humans have a relatively small range of hearing. Cats and dogs can hear much further. Rodents, very high frequencies. What makes a good sound compared to a poor sound? Well, let's go find out. Bells, like in this bell tower, are tuned to have beautiful sound. They do it by actually shaping the metal. In different parts of the bell make different tones. Because you can have just a single pitch and a computer or a synthesizer can make that. But what really makes a sound appealing, that gives it that melodious feeling, are overtones and undertones. Not just the frequency of the note, but frequencies that are higher and lower. I'm not the world's best singer, but let's see if I can illustrate. First, here's a note. Ooh. All bells will have both something that's an octave lower, ooh, and an octave higher. So, we have an octave lower and an octave higher, an undertone and an overtone. But you're not done. Bells get that particular beautiful resonant sound because they have a major fifth. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's the major fifth. And a minor third. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So when you hit the bell, you get There are some bells, and they don't look like a normal bell. A normal bell has this nice bell-shaped curve. If you go to the Crystal Palace, their bells have an extra little wiggle in them because they put an extra overtone in it. So this is really an intricate machine. I mean, the, the gears, you guys have always heard about how many gears you have in watches, right? A bunch of tiny little gears and mechanical watches. This is like that, but all spread out. Magnetic Bill, how long have you been maintaining this? Okay, I worked for the university for two and a half years. Okay. And I was told um, by the uh, vice provost that this was my baby. All right. And as a facilities electrician, that one of the, there's, there's very few things that are very integral to the university experience. Almost everyone wants to see the alma mater and almost everyone remembers going to the Illini Union for something, but when the alumni come here, the first thing the alumni want to do is they want to see the alma mater and they usually mull around long enough and they hear the bells and they go, oh, the chime bells, oh, the concerts they used to play. Yep. So it's, 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 the, it's not just the, the visual side of the campus, but this is the, the audible things that people hear in campus and the things that people hear that that cement the campus and the heritage and, and the memories that they have of it. Absolutely. I mean, bells are, by tradition, the way to call and to gather the masses, the, the church bells, the town bells, the bells ringing for, for emergencies. Um, sound counts. And we're going to learn today how it all works. This is our hour bell. And manufacturing of bells is an art form. To get the exact tone you want, you have to trim off and cut off just the right amount of metals. And it's not just because you want to make a particular note. If I just made that note, 
the sound would be very tinny. It sound like an electronic synthesizer, not the beautiful dulcet tones of an awesome actual brass bell. To get that, you need overtones and undertones. And to get each of those frequencies just right, the mass has to be distributed perfectly. So the people who actually manufacture and make and shape bells are masters of their crafts. So this area here is the sound bowl. And you can see little shiny spots, and that's where clappers have hit them over time. The clapper could start here in the middle, but that would mean that the cable would have to pull it all the way over to the edge. And that would be very difficult to actually pull on down below. So the clapper starts near the edge, and when that handle is pushed, the actual bell, the actual clapper, moves and hits the sound bowl of the bell. And I can do that with my knuckles, right? But if I had a big, giant, heavy hammer, I could make a much louder sound, as we will probably soon hear. So you can also see that you could put more bells in here, right? You could put another layer up there of smaller bells. The smaller the bell, the higher the pitch. But each of these bells is a massive investment. And of course, it has to get up here. And that's why classes over time in the 19-teens uh, donated money the graduating class to then buy a bell and you'll notice some of these say they're the bells of the class of a certain year. It's a very venerable structure but it's up high here so that these sounds can be heard over all of campus. So the cables come from down below and these cables then have to pull a bell. Ooh, you know what? Let me do it right here. Ooh. Okay, sorry, classes, uh, you're in session. All right, so you pull the cable, it moves it over, and you hear how the bell is still ringing? This one is well-tuned. This one's been honed and made just right. Hopefully all of them have. The largest bell, the one you're next to there, right, that will be the lowest note, and the smallest bell will be for the highest ones, which are some of the ones up here. The outside hammers are for the hourly chimes, and the inside ones are for the songs that you can play. to the hour for the last part of it. So if you did not have a real bell that was perfectly engineered to give you those wonderful undertones and overtones, you would have a sound that sounded more like that. Tinny, like a xylophone. Not the type of sound memory you'd have from the university. So those are beautiful sounds of the bells. What about annoying sounds? Like chalk on a chalkboard. Why is it so annoying? Well, once again, it's not a single frequency. There's a few frequencies. But they have nothing to do with being an octave apart or a fifth apart or something that our bodies and our minds think of harmonious. They just happen to be the vibrations of the chalk molecules, the chalk sticking and moving, sticking and moving, sticking and moving as it's dragged across the board. Chalk always does that. That's how it leaves chalk behind. But if you get it just at the right angle with the right hardness and you get that horrible squeak, it's because you get multiple frequencies that are not at all at some pleasing interval. That's how things work.